One of the reasons people love San Francisco is because it is the place where every type of person is welcome, where every type of idea is considered. It's the most open and diverse place in the country. And I think the concern is that we lose some of that, and that we start, if we start to become homogenous and we have one group that becomes disproportionately influential. At first, I was against San Francisco becoming a mini New York. It has been pointed out to me that San Francisco has always been about money, starting with the gold rush, and that it has always been evolving and developing and changing. I don't see myself as being able to stay in San Francisco. I don't want to settle for a windowless apartment that has no stove and takes more than two thirds of my income. But still holding on, looking for that magic combination that hopefully is out there, you know. In San Francisco, if you lose your home, you're basically, you have to leave the city and maybe the whole region. So people who are affordably housed, we've got to fight to keep them in their housing. Eviction is a huge cause of homelessness, overwhelmingly impacts people of color, overwhelmingly impacts black and brown people in San Francisco and across the country. Most of my fears and hopes center around the homelessness crisis in San Francisco. My fear is that we're unable to recover from it, and my hope is that we're able to lead the way in terms of how the world deals with something like this. We're not unique in this sense, we're just ahead of the game. I think there's a general feeling amongst the privileged and the housed that, you know, this is something that happens to other people and that it's something that happens when people have done something wrong. We're all very close to the edge and a couple of paychecks away from losing it all and being out on the street. So we kind of need to see ourselves and the people on the street and that, you know, that could be us. I've had three battles with landlords in this town. Three major battles. I never thought I would ever be homeless. I've always had a home. And for 10 years not having one, essentially it's taken quite a toll on my health. People hear the word landlord and they seem to think of sort of a mustachioed monopoly man. Landlords in general aren't a monolithic group. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of housing providers they rely on their rental income to pay their mortgage, to pay their property taxes, which fund city services. In landlord-tenant, there's a relationship, it's ongoing, it could be for years, and you find often that there are subtexts and histories and unresolved feelings that are actually generating at the surface of what this dispute seems to be about. And suddenly things escalate because the leaky roof didn't get fixed. I have been a tenant for 27 years in this building, uh, more or less the de facto manager. As people move in or out, I'm the person who's been here who tries to take care of everybody. There's only six units. A guy who lives in San Carlos bought the building for an investment. And they have forced one by one through evictions and bullying and uh, cutting off services and wearing us down and in one case buying us off. We are now three people in the building. You know, I grew up in a working class family. We didn't have a lot of money, but we always had a house. My father was smart, he went after the war as a veteran, and he bought stuff under the GI Bill, bought the rental place, and he bought our place. And a home is not just a physical space.
space. And my partner and I had a home for 20 years. I've always had a home. And for 10 years not having one, you don't know what's happening day to day. So what happened was I ended up at a hotel in North Beach, which I've been going to for many years. And there's a law in San Francisco, you can't stay in a hotel longer than 28 days. Because after 28 days, you're considered a resident. And residence means you get tenants rights. You have occupancy rights. So I came up to my third week and I went to the manager and I said, look, you know me, I've been here. She said, well, here, you can fill this out. And it was all this stuff about they wanted a huge deposit. It was $1,100 a month in rent. It was, uh, they wanted background check, all this stuff, ridiculous stuff, even though they knew me. And half the application is the type of person you were. So I thought, you already know that. <laughs> so they said, there's nothing I can do about it. I um, was born in San Francisco, but I haven't lived here all my life, at Mount Zion before it became UCSF. And I've lived here since 1989. My original landlord sold the building in 2014. Didn't want anything to do with housemates or dogs or anything. He just wanted to deal with me as the master tenant. Then the place was sold and the new landlord wanted me to get rid of the dog. And of course that wasn't going to happen. Music City is, it's a lot of things. We are a historic building here at Bush and Polk in San Francisco, or 28,000 square feet of space. The top two floors of our project are 36 rooms that are dedicated to residents and travelers. Until we closed in November of last year, we operated 14 fully backlined music studios in the bottom floor, which uh, was home to a couple thousand musicians who used our facilities monthly. We close that in November in order to begin a construction project which will expand to the next two floors. I'm lucky to work for a guy like Rudy who, uh, you know, he's a landlord. Landlords, <laughs> they got their own set of goals and everything, but Rudy has a real sense of compassion to the way that he manages his properties. And with this project in particular, it comes totally from a vision that he has about being a resource for musicians and music enthusiasts here. And because he comes at it from that moral place, we manage this place from a real place of compassion. And um, I feel very lucky because, uh, again, there's there are so many landlords in the city that just see uh, tenants as a way to make money and so to be able to work for a residential project that doesn't take that approach is uh, refreshing as a San Franciscan in particular. I first came to be interested in housing issues as an attorney. I had the opportunity to work on some cases where I represented children who had been lead poisoned by a slumlord. And so I learned a lot about housing issues from working on those cases, uh, and I started to represent tenants in cases against landlords originally. I then came to be interested in housing issues as a mediator. I was trained to be a mediator here in San Francisco, and I mediated disputes between co-tenants and roommates. And I've also worked with some single home owners on helping them figure out how to rent their places to friends of theirs. I came to be interested in housing issues more personally when I found myself uh, without a home after I was in a uh, 
rent control place with a one-year-old and my partner and our place burned down. And so I found myself dislocated and without a stable residence for two years and we moved seven times from place to place and that experience really made me even more passionate about what had been a little bit of a philosophical interest in housing. But I've always been interested in the root causes of what leads people to be without a home. And now I have had the personal experience of feeling what it's like to not have secure housing. And um, it's just such an important issue. I think it's a fundamental right for people to be housed. So I am one of uh, the lucky ones with rent control. I got interested when other people started having housing issues. I thought I could help be a voice uh, because I was untouchable. I live in a very rundown uh, building in a uh, very upscale, beautiful neighborhood. And that used to be okay here. You could live cheek to jowl with, with rich people and it wasn't a problem. As the city began to rapidly, rapidly change, it just started going from, hey, how cool that you're doing your thing, to like, oh, you're lucky to have rent control, to being, hey, we want your apartment, to now uh, actual hostility of, uh, in my case, uh, 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 an absentee owner who bought the building three years ago and has just like declared war on uh, the tenants in the building. Our legal system makes it relatively easy to evict people. We really elevate property rights over human rights. You know, in California, for example, if you are late on your rent, you have only three days to pay that before your tenancy can be terminated. Obviously, amidst the coronavirus crisis, so many people can't pay their rent. But even without a health crisis, so many people are just one paycheck away from not being able to pay their rent. And to think about a system that allows a landlord to evict someone if they have to wait four days for their rent instead of three. Like, that's our system here. I called uh, Supervisor Peskin's office and I talked to Kevin down at Lower Polk Gulch. He automatically referred me to, uh, I didn't know this was happening, to someone at the American Bar Association. And he asked me if I would want an attorney, a mediator, to try to mediate this deal for me to stay. She called me and she asked what was going on. She says, okay, well, I'm an independent mediator. I don't represent you and I don't represent uh, the hotel. So I'm gonna go and see what we can do. This all happened within about a week. Well, I think it certainly fills one of the gaps that exist in our social service, you know, safety net. You know, homelessness is so complex and people arrive at homelessness in a number of ways. And this clinic addresses the, the one particular cause of homelessness that is displacement. Um, and, you know, it attempts to, you know, patch that hole in the safety net so that people don't get unnecessarily uh, pushed out into the street when there are other options available to them. It's a lot cheaper to keep somebody housed than it is to get them off the street. The average cost to help a homeless person per year, it's about, per, per homeless person, it works out to about $3,300, which I think is, is actually reasonable. 
I think that's the humane thing to do is to spend that money, our, our taxpayer money, to help people. I would, when I was homeless, I appreciated those services. When I was living in transitional housing, I appreciated those services. I didn't appreciate that they were hard to get, but I appreciated that they were there. Now, the cost for the tenant landlord clinic to help keep somebody housed, 1200 bucks per, per person we help. So it's a lot less expensive for the taxpayers of San Francisco to keep people housed. Uh, I don't even know if there was one specific incident, but we went round and round about the dog. And um, finally I got that eviction notice and all that started in. And then we went to mediation. So the TLC is really different. The TLC is on the ADR side of the house, so the alternative dispute resolution side through the Bar Association, and that's where our conflict intervention service comes in. So we've partnered with the Lower Polk TLC um, to provide free mediation services to residents, tenants, housing providers, master tenants, subtenants, and now through the Lower Polk small merchant mediation as well. We really do feel that conflict is part of everyday life and engaging in conflict is really important and there are some best practices around that and we start small with can we have a conversation about this and there might be some very high escalated emotions around what's going on and we understand that we're not afraid of that and we need that to also air and come forward and it's amazing the way that mediation can position folks or place people in a conversation together that they never thought they could really have. It's not all about adversarial, you know, tenant landlord fights, but it's also about um, giving landlords and tenants um, a way to mediate between them, to work stuff out and when it doesn't work out to give uh, the tenants the resources they need to um, not be evicted. We came to a solution, you know, uh, um, that works for both of us. And that was important because I wasn't going to move. They were going to have to carry me out of here. If the mediation hadn't worked, it would have been a long, drawn-out court battle, probably, and lots of money, which I don't have. And the mediator looks at both sides. You look at both sides, and that's... Um, it's so much more valuable in saving time and money and stress, for sure. And now I have a pretty good relationship with the landlord. They started doing renovations uh, without permits, literally breaking windows, throwing things out into the ground, not covering doors. Became a health issue for a couple of us. And then suddenly a knock on my door at seven in the morning, being served papers. So yeah, nightmare. I mean, I, my life was turned upside down, even though um, it was eventually dismissed, but that took five months. And in the interim, I mean, I had to cancel my 60th birthday. I didn't know where I was gonna live. He didn't care if I ended up homeless. And the irony, of course, is that I, I work with the homeless. I, I'm the pizza lady, and uh, I've been taking care of my neighbors uh, every day for, for years. So Andrea is a classic Lower Polk person, and she has lived in this neighborhood for decades. 
and she has taken it upon herself to collect leftover food from restaurants and all the restaurants here love her and she takes it out and she gives it to the unhoused people in this neighborhood every single day and she has lived in this neighborhood for decades and she has a landlord who um, if it were not for Kevin and my office, not me, but my staff, Lee Hepner, uh, who has intervened repeatedly um, with legal authorities and the rent board, uh, would, be, would be amongst the homeless population that she serves. There are some housing providers and landlords that are just profit driven. You know, they're just going to be looking at spreadsheets and sort of the dollar amount at the end of the day. Thankfully, what we've experienced and what we've sort of learned is that that's not most housing providers here in San Francisco. Many of our members aren't cash rich folks. Um, they, they have an asset in a rent controlled uh, apartment building, um, but they don't operate on a day-to-day -day basis with tons of cash in their pockets. Um, they receive their rents, and they pay their property taxes, and they pay their mortgages, um, and they maintain their building, and they provide a service to their residents. Everybody sort of has their own story, and they come from different perspectives. And there's a lot of acrimony in the landlord-tenant relationship in general, but one of the unique things about the TLC is its approach. A lot of our members really value their tenants and they don't want to lose their tenants. They want to know that somebody is there representing them and the TLC provides sort of a unique forum for us to come together and for everybody to be represented. Mediation is a way to say, look, this is going to be something that we can't use in a lawsuit. We're going to have this protected conversation where let's just find out if we can solve the problem here and get what we both need. What do you need? You want somebody that's gonna be paying the rent eventually? Great. You need to figure out a creative way to come up with finances? Great. What can we do together? Mediation works because it, people start from a proposition of I wanna solve this. We're filming this in the time of COVID and I can't tell you um, the spike in needs, understandably, that are there. Uh, to really adjudicate or otherwise mediate between landlords and tenants as to what's going to happen next in terms of affording rents, closing a business, altering a lease, making payment plans, all kinds of things that are obviously on the table now to keep businesses sustainable hopefully in San Francisco and we're very proud to play, play an active role in that um, as, as well as with, with residents who are also, as we know, um, we're struggling even before COVID with the rising rents in San Francisco and now of course in particular are needing that support. So with our conflict intervention service and through the TLC we really emphasize the idea that the landlord-tenant relationship is that, it's a relationship. And we really want to try to foster constructive communication inside that relationship so that conflicts de-escalate so that a win-win can be worked out um, for both the tenant and the landlord. <laughs>